Hi teammates, this is Sean J. McCall as usual, the host of the Eurostep where we look to get behind the scene, behind the curtain of European basketball, basketball in general, but um, a, lot of, a lot of focus on European basketball and those that are around, inside, somehow contributing to the game. And um, yeah, before we begin, please look at the bottom of your screen uh, in the comment box if you'd like to throw in a question that I can ask while the the interview is going on, please feel free. If you want everybody to see it, do it in the comment, comment box. If you just want me to see it, then do it with the question mark with the speech bubble on it. And then I'll try to infuse those questions in as the interview goes on. So let's get started. Um, I am notoriously bad with names, but I'm hoping I'm getting this one right. Christoph Veradell is my guest tonight, and um, he's not only a former college and professional player, but also an author, a fellow author. Yay, fellow authors. Um, his, his book, Win the Day, is something that I've read and I think is fantastic, and um, it's a testament to taking your destiny into your own hands. And he gives a plan. He like actually maps out a plan on how you can do that, not just for basketball players or athletes in general, but people in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about as well. So let me get my guest in. Let me get him in. Where are you at, buddy? There you are, sending an invite. And he should be on in a couple seconds. And we'll get started. Ooh. Here we go. Oh, hey, I made Christoph, it. Christoph, how you doing? Did I did I butcher your name? Yeah, no, it was perfect. Yeah, was perfect. <laughs> I'm on <Yeah>. fire. <laughs> See that? Me too. So, <laughs> thank you for joining my my little show, man. I really appreciate it. No, thanks to you. It's uh, Instagram Live is a premiere for me. <laughs> That's so, okay, man. You you you. you I got the mustache. That. You see. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> you hit that accept button really good, so you're you're on fire right now, buddy. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get started, man. Um, Christoph, this is how it's gonna go. If if there's anything, um, it should be real chill, just a real like conversation, you know. And just speak your speak your truth, speak your peace. Um, I'm not interrupting my guests when they're telling their stories, so it should be real, just chill and easy. If there's anything you don't want to talk about, don't. You can be polite and say, I'm not talking about that, but I'm not out for sound bites, so it's not like I'm going to ask you Stephen A. Smith questions to, to get ratings here. So um, awesome. it should just be real chill. All right? Sounds good. Okay, so let's get started, man. Um, before we really get started, though, I want to point out to, I want to, point out to my teammates just how old I am. Um, Christoph is from a city not too far away from Geneva, where I played for two seasons. And um, and it could be, it could be that Christoph watched me play um, while I was in Geneva. I was 31 back then, like a 2000, 2000, uh, 2004 to 2006, I played in Geneva. So how old were you back then, Christoph? I mean, I'm from 1990, so I was uh, 15. Yeah, so that was, that was about the time when you really started taking basketball seriously. Yeah, the funny the funny part is the year after I believe it was two thousand eight, two thousand seven. To yeah, I think two thousand seven or two thousand eight. Uh, I played in the Swiss Cup because it was the first year I played second division with the, uh -huh. the youth team, but it was second division, like an academy thing. Right. And we played against Geneva in, <laughs> in the Swiss Cup. <laughs> it was the first time I played against uh, pro players and mm -hmm. missed mm -hmm. playing against you by one year, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. The basketball world is so small, man. It's, it's incredibly small. Sometimes it is, yeah. <laughs> and so, so you were like 14, 15, and I was like 31. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's get started. So, and like today, before, 31. Huh? today I'm 31. See? You see how, you see how it, it works, man? The, the the circle closes itself. <laughs> All right. So as, as I said before, you grew up in Switzerland, um, which, like my adopted country of Austria, um, is not a hotbed of basketball talents, as you would say. 
um, and you decided at a very early age, at, at like 14, that you would dedicate yourself to basketball. You would really go for full on basketball and dedicate your life, which took an incredible sacrifice, not just on your part, but also your family's part. Um, and in the efforts to be the best basketball player that you could be. Uh, my first question is, looking back on it, was it worth it? Um, looking back on it 100%, I think that the game has brought me I I don't know if it brought me more than I gave because I gave a lot, but I gave <laughs> I, got lot, I got a lot back, and I'm still to this day uh, getting getting back from the game, yeah. which I think is really it's really important because I also so many players who were used by the game, you know, mm. where uh, it's like a famous phrase that we say, use the game, don't let the game use you, right, and. Um, and I think it's important to also think about it when you're young because uh, so many players get burned out by the game. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think I was able to manage to, to, to do quite the opposite, even though there was really tough times, for sure. I mean, for those of you that haven't read the book yet, I, I've read it so I, I know, like, you really dedicated yourself at a very, at a pretty young age. So what did that do for your family life, the, the, the way that you were being raised and everything? He's like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything for basketball. You're missing grandma and grandpa's uh, uh, birthdays. You're missing all kinds of stuff at a very early age. How did that affect your family, that you were so focused? Yeah, well, the thing is, uh, coming from grow, growing up in Europe, and I guess a lot of people from Europe maybe are listening right now, um it's just especially in those days the basketball world was just something completely looking like another planet mm -hmm. and so at the moment and i was not alone in, in in this case at the moment we loved basketball we were just like man this is all it is about <laughs> so it, I, I don't even know if it was a decision more than just okay this is just how it is Right. But in terms of sacrifices, it didn't feel like it didn't feel like it to me because I would for sure uh, rather be on the court or waking up in the morning to go train than than going out with friends or doing whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So looking back on it, it was a lot of sacrifices. The stories show it show that it was a lot of sacrifices. Right. But it didn't feel like it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, my, my, parent, my mom sometimes got a little upset. <laughs> my uh, my best friend is actually Swiss. He, I, I met him when I was in in Geneva, when I was playing in G Geneva. And he's he's like ten years younger than me, so I'm kind of like his his big brother, right? And so when I was 31, he was like 21, and then he ended up going to college in Canada. But if I think back to those days, to to you know, he was not getting paid. You know, he was pretty much a professional practicing with us all the time. Um, was it like that for you growing up too, that you were really like an unpaid professional before you went to college? We'll get to that in a minute. But before you took the step to college, how was it like for you growing up in the Swiss basketball system like that as a youth? Well, I think it's different than than U.S. guys. I I never even thought I could, I would ever get paid to play basketball <laughs> until I was very old, you know? Uh, so until I was 17, 18, even 19, it was not even something on my mind to get paid to play the game. We just play because this is what we do. And so even sometimes I would, I would think some, I would read stories of players who wouldn't, wouldn't play because they're not paid enough or whatever. And I, would, I was like, yeah, they're crazy. <laughs> you know, like I would play, you know, it's, I see them, they, they're playing in arenas with 5,000 people. I, I would be ready to pay to play. You know, actually, right. this is one big thing. Uh, up until I went, um, up until I got to college, I always paid to play. So until 20 years old, 19 or 20 years old, I paid to play basketball. So the other way around was not even realistic. You know, it wasn't even in your thought process. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were just playing because that's what you love to do pretty much 
So I see um, uh, one of my teammates here wrote, same here in Costa Rica, some get paid and some never get anything for their whole career. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy that, that people, if, if that's what you love, though, you don't even think about it. You don't, you, you don't think about the... Yeah, the it's, a different, it's a different uh, situation than growing up in the U.S. where, where right. you know many guys who played or had careers and you know many people who get uh, a living from basketball and growing up here, I mean, everybody tells you it's not realistic. You, know? right. you don't even think about it. Well, I think in, in the States also, it's also a, a vehicle for, for many players to go to college. I think, I think everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to go to the NBA for sure. No question. And nobody's thinking, oh, I'm in the States. I mean, nobody's thinking, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to Europe. No, everybody's thinking I'm going to be an NBA player, right? But for a lot of people, it's also the question of going to college, getting a free education and, and doing something with their lives outside of basketball as well. And it's different over here in Europe, whereas in the States, and okay, actually, I wanted to talk about this later, but in the States, you can combine going to school and your sport, whereas over here, it's very difficult for younger players to combine sport and their education. Yeah. Well, Was that difficult for you as well before you went to college? Yes, that's actually something I touched in, in the book at yeah. some point. Uh, I think for basketball and for talent development, the the U.S. system is incredible because um, over here we lose so many players at 17, 18, right. 19, and the big leap of progress Happens comes later. Really. You know, at 18, you might yeah. be a good player, but actually the very best players at 18, you know, in the, on, the, on the 18 national team, on the 20 national team, is very rarely that those are the same guys who are going to be the best at 25 or 30 years old. Yeah. And the U.S. system is incredible because it allows players, it allows a vast amount of players, a huge pool of players to, even though they're not very good, some of them, some of them mm. very good, some of them not very good. The very good ones, they go to the SEC, the ACC, or whatever. The not so good one, they go like me. Uh, small D1 or even D2 and some of them D3, but then they get these four years or some of them five years uh, of of just I would I wouldn't say undivided attention, but right. very basketball focus, focus for yeah. those who really want to invest. Yeah. And now if you're gonna invest so much time playing basketball between uh, 18 or 19 and 22, 23 years old now. After four years, you're not the same players. And right. this is also why there's so many players coming out of Clemson and Alabama and all that. And they come out, they can't even play professional. And some other guys went D2 and they're just absolutely killing. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like I'm talking about killing. Exactly. We're here, you know. What? Um, so I can't see my, my thing. Um no, what I want to say is not many kids really, really, yeah, like you said, they, they at 17, 18, they start to make different choices with basketball. But you were already focused at a younger age. And as you as you got older and developed, then it, it only got stronger, that will yeah. to, to, to play. Um, what were the things that you were doing as a youngster to reach your goals? Well, I think... The thing that, that, well, I was not very blessed with a, a great basketball body. I'm, I'm quite athletic, I would say, but not for basketball. I'm good at every other sport except basketball. I was <laughs> you know, skinny. I could never really, I never dunked in a game. Uh, <laughs> actually, I dunked maybe less than 10 times in my life, probably. <laughs> um, but I was always very cautious to pay attention to details. And I was also very uh very much able to recognize where my strength was mm -hmm. uh and and one of them were i mean big just to, to for the audience to understand uh, if we have young players uh one of those strengths was to really execute what the coach wanted mm -hmm. so i would always be at the right right place on the floor uh 
doing what the coach asks on defense, whatever. But on, on offense, not so much. I'll take some crazy shots. But <laughs> if I part of the game, I would be able to execute. And this is what a lot of time allowed me to enjoy more freedom as well. Uh, and, and I think this is a, a skill that is looked upon a lot from players. Um, because only when you're on the floor and only when your coach trusts you and only right. when, uh, when you know you can do a mistake and not get put out of the game, can, right. you, can you gain confidence and, and, and try exactly. new things, you know? Exactly. And this is something I, I, I explained in the book. I think the skill that players look upon the most is that they have to be their coach's number one best soldier <laughs> And yeah. this this way they can stay in the game and and um, and perform. And I think this is this is what separated me. That you know, b despite my physical abilities that were not so good, uh, that I was able to always be good enough to go up the levels, you know, and stay in the teams and keep the dream alive. Let's talk about when you were 16 and you watched your first March Madness. Um, can you tell that story? Uh, of, of what you felt that 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 at that time you're 16 years old you're watching who was it Kansas against who? Uh, Kansas Kentucky. Kansas Kentucky, yeah. and you're watching that game. Can you tell that story? I thought that was a great story in the book. Uh, yeah, no, I mean you know we didn't have any NCAA channels here, and right. I think me and my friend went to another friend's place, and he might have been even sleeping. I'm not even sure. I remember <laughs> where we watched it, but it was not at my house, not as not as his house. And uh, yeah, so we're looking at this. I just don't know anything about NCAA. You know, I don't know who are those those, those, those teams and all that. But uh, yeah, watching this thing like it's really another planet, and trying to see if players are doing anything special. Or I can incorporate in my game and the game is just so much different as well right. than the way we play and then at some point <laughs> the, 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 the camera <laughs> zooms in on, on the bench I think it was Kansas bench and they're just here like tattoos <laughs> and biceps and they're just all like two meters and <laughs> and I'm just like oh man this is this the, what am I doing here this, <laughs> this is my goal but I got no chance to get there and uh yeah th this is really really crazy because because up to the day only only six years later i'm i'm playing in the sweet 16 and this was ex uh yeah yeah no it was a uh, round of 32. it was round of 32 and only six only six years later i'm playing for florida gulf coast in a round of 32 and cwa march madness and uh i get i wouldn't say great stats but this decent stats play 24 minutes so mm -hmm. So from the time at 16, where I just I'm looking at this like this is absolutely <laughs> out of reach uh, to to having an impact and winning the game in the same stage of competition exactly six days mm -hmm. uh, six years to the day uh, that that's a pretty crazy story yeah <laughs> that's that's I think that's so crazy that's so sick but it's also a testament to your drive that you you really you 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 could have you could have easily watch that game and thought geez okay i'm never going to reach this level so i'm going to take up scuba diving you know like you could yeah, have no, totally and, thrown you off and it probably would have been the wiser decision <laughs> but the problem is you know some well the problem or the gift is sometimes you just don't have a choice and and if you just love it so much and you just have no idea what else to do what else to do you just keep going doing the same thing you know options is not always the best <laughs> <laughs> um let's fast forward a little bit so you talked a little bit about it before that you ended up going to florida gulf coast university um how did you how did you go about as a swiss kid as a as maybe not a top prospect kind of kid how did you get a, a d1 scholarship well, first, uh, I was very fortunate that family, my family could afford sending me to prep school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very lucky also that when I, well, first graduating from high school is, is, not, is not easy in Switzerland. So that was a big struggle because mm -hmm. like you say, it's like either sport or school and I chose sport, but I had to do school in, in order to do sports. So <laughs> it, it was a real struggle. Uh, and 
and basically I would say as a gift I get one year the one year off and try to take a shot at my dream and for me it was not even at the time okay I'm gonna try to get a scholarship I was just okay I'm gonna go there and play um, but that's that's the first luck is that I'm able to go to prep school and the second thing is my teammate uh, Paul Costello is the guy I watched the game with uh, his dad is a former um, NCAA standout for Providence College went to the Final Four and, and mm -hmm. played in the NBA and was a huge superstar in Europe and so he, when it was time for me to go there he made some phone calls and we got recommended to go to Worcester Academy which is a prep school in the NEPSAC which is the best uh, which at the time I think it still is the best prep school league in the country mm -hmm. Uh, so, so again, unlike so many players who, who are looking to go to the States, uh, I had top-notch, uh, I would say, guidance to make it in a good program with, with great people, great coaches who look after the players because that's not always a given. Some, some right. guys go to prep schools and the prep school take the money and they don't even look for a place for the, get the kids to go. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, so I get there. I play, uh, I pulled my hamstring with national team a few months before, take the, take the year, uh, take the summer off, go back, don't do any rehab. They press me to play. I start playing after two or three weeks, I crazy sharp pain in the back and I get a herniated disc. So I just can't barely move. They told me, oh, it's fine. It's just a herniated disc and they make me do rehab and then I can just basically get by. But... I had a really, really tough season. Uh, physically, I could barely move, but I play. I played every game. <laughs> but uh, that's crazy. Uh, uh, now, the the path to go to get a D one scholarship was absolutely crazy. There's so many other other things that go with this. But long story short, uh, the the month of May approaches, and I realized that. My grade transfers from Switzerland do not add up to a 2.0 GPA. It adds up to like a 1.8 GPA. And so we have to uh, do a bunch of appeals. And then at the end, it goes to 2.01 GPA. Which <laughs> is so then my SAT that I did that was a decent grade back in the days, it's just not enough anymore. Right. So now I got to retake my SAT in May to try to have a better grade or I'm uneligible to go play college basketball. Right. And so then it's May and all the teams that kind of were interested are moved on already. So I also don't have any scholarship <laughs> uh, on the table. And the craziest of all is that uh, a combination of two things happened. One thing uh, is my teammate wanted to go to school in Florida. He sent the tape out to Florida Gulf Coast. And I guess the coaches, from what I got, from what was reported to me, the coaches saw this and they said, oh, we don't like number 12, but we like number five, <laughs> which was me. <laughs> and, don't tell me you stole your friend's scholarship. <laughs> something like this. And, and on top of that, uh, Billy Barron, is now a EuroLeague star was in my team and he was getting recruited by Tony Bennett uh, University of Virginia yeah. and Tony Bennett's cousin was at Florida Gulf Coast so they were also able to get more info about me and and uh, and from what was reported to me it's also thanks to Tony Bennett who had also watched me play because he, he came to watch what's your With team that, yeah uh, was able to tell them, yeah, you got to take this kid when actually no, no, the D1 was taking the chance on me. So at the end, I had Florida Gulf Coast and at the, and, and uh, San Francisco, New York that offered me. And those, those are the only two choices I had. And what, 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 was, it, what was it about Florida that, that so you said, okay, I'm, I'm, that's where I'm going? Uh, I mean, you know, you're, uh, you're from Switzerland. <laughs> I had, uh, had sinus sinus problems growing up. I was always in the cold here, and, and I think when when the Florida school offered it, it was a no brainer, you know, like at the sun and all that. It's yeah, 
Yeah, I get it. I mean, it was. I, I wish I could say, yeah, I was very smart. I did my homework about the team. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the honesty. <laughs> Yes, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the honesty. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, as a European, what was your college experience like? Not not so much basketball, but just the the quality of living and your your experience of living in the states. Because one thing that I that I very often do is I I tell a lot of players, European players, that some of my foreign players or, or players that I know, that if they have a chance to go to the states, they should. Um, one reason is because your 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 team out here is always going to want you. That you're you're a German citizen uh, or Swiss citizen, and if you come back, they always need German players. They always need Swiss players, so they're always going to want you. But the thing about going to the states is not even so much for the basketball, just for the 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 living, the experience of being on your own away from home and living in America. Like that, I think that brings so much to European players when they go overseas to America. So, um, how was your experience, and was it was it what you thought it would be? Uh, I I have the same approach as you uh, in terms of if you can go, you should go. Now I see a lot of players that are forcing to go as well, which is mm. not not so yeah. good. And and the the biggest advice I could give is do not go before you finish high school, uh, because unless you're a stud, like if you're a stud and you know you're yeah. gonna get. The scholarship because you're six nine and windmilling yeah. this, the ball and all that. That's a different story. But a lot of players here leave um, before high school. Then they get their high school diploma. They come back. Come and back and it's school, the high school diploma yeah. is not recognized here. Yeah. So crazy. yeah. But to answer your question, that was just a little parenthesis uh, to to express my values. But uh, my experience, man, uh, for me, it was a big five year vacation. <laughs> year vacation and, and I mean it was completely crazy uh, I mean it, it got normal to a point and, and I was working extremely hard especially on, on my basketball game not so much in school but I took care of the grades of yeah. course like we all do not by <laughs> uh, but in terms of living you know especially being from Switzerland I got to live you know, in, in, in great places, in three great places out of four. One place was, was not so great when I was in Alabama, but um, uh, Worcester, Florida, uh, Hawaii, uh, basically for free. Actually, you know, uh, when I got this, the, 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 the scholarship to go to Florida, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I'm doing two years here, then I'm transferring two years redshirting one then I'm transferring <laughs> so I get to do three places because you know this is crazy to be able to be in the states you know like I'm right. never, I don't I'm not gonna probably not gonna get a green card or whatever right. I just take advantage to be able to live in those great places that that allow me to play the game I love uh, and, and get the most out of it you know so uh, so yeah that was that was really a great great time and I did end up be play in three colleges in three places. So, <laughs> so it was nice. Um, one of the teammates asked, "How was the language barrier, if there was one? How good was your English before you went out?" Not very good. Really? So my, my first year, I'm still in great, great, great connection with my coaches from prep school. Uh, actually, after my playing career for four years, I ran AU tours for young Swiss players, and I would bring them back to. Uh, to my prep school <laughs> and still to this day they make fun of me and and, I, and, <laughs> and for the way i spoke and and i also used i also used many times uh the language barrier excuse to just <laughs> act like i just had no idea what was going on i, I damn sure knew <laughs> exactly what was going on <laughs> i love it i love it <laughs> um you're actually you just gave it. I was going to ask you what what piece of advice would you give to any European players that that want to um, go overseas, go go to college? But you already mentioned it that they should finish their high school in the yeah, I, I country. Think, I think for me, yeah, that that's the thing, and 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 I really get it. It's really really painful to to go through what we have to go through here. 
but at the same time, you know, like if you want to go there, then you really have to make those crazy sacrifices. Meaning, just, you know, maybe you have taken one hour bus to go to the gym and it's just like this every single right. day. And you go home at 11 and, and the next day you have to wake up at six. Uh, and it's just really, for me, you know, the last two, especially the last two years of high school was really, really tough. Um, but it's really, it's really hard when you, I've had friends who came back from the U.S. because uh, they didn't get scholarships because it's really hard and it comes a lot to right. get a scholarship, especially right. nowadays. Uh, and, and they go home and, and then they can't go to university because their high school is, diploma is not recognized. And then they're like, oh man, what am I doing? And then for two, three years, they just really, really struggle because they have to start all over again. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a totally different system. And, and I think not a lot of people are aware of that, um, that when they come back, if, if they didn't get their their Latura or diploma here in, in Europe, that when they come back, it's, it's hardly recognized. Your, your high school um, diploma is hardly recognized. And I think, I think it's the responsibility of those that have done it, such as yourself, to give exactly the advice that you're giving right now or in the book. Like, hey. Well, this is, this is, this is what I was going to say. I think you said it right. The whole, the whole message of the book is to, to give the responsibility of development to the player. And this is only up to, up to the players. And it really doesn't matter where you are. Uh, there's always things that you can do to get better, even if you don't have a gym. And uh, and at the end of the day, if you're good enough, then most likely, you know, you're going to get recognized right. one day or the other. You just got to keep pushing. But it's really your own responsibility. And a lot of players here, you know, they really think, oh, if they go abroad, then it's going to be automatic. They become a good player. But if you're not giving 100% here, you're going to go anywhere else. And you're not <laughs> giving yeah. Up. It's going to be the same. Same shit, different toilet. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's go back to ball. So, Florida, Florida Gulf Coast had a, had a Cinderella story, um, March Madness run. Tell us about, like, so you won your, your tournament, right? Or were you, a, you won your tournament to get into March Madness? Yes, we got, we got second seed during the regular season. All right. Uh, Mercer University was first seed, and then we beat them in the final at their place. Uh, and, and that booked you into that booked you into March Madness. So, exactly. so you, you win the tournament. Mm -hmm. What is the team's mood going into March Madness? Did you guys really think you could like go as far as you did, or were you just kind of like happy to be there and whatever happens happens? Uh, I, I think. I think it was split. It was split, but all all it takes usually in the team is a few guys to to really believe. Uh, if you want to ask my take, in all honesty, I was like, "Wow, this is great!" Like I never could have imagined we we got there because the story is the year before my sophomore year, we lose in the final against Belmont University, and and you know we we get to the final and I'm thinking this is this is my shot and we actually up 10 in the first half and it's like we're just really close and then they blew us off and uh and and at the end of the game I just I just threw the racks of ball and <laughs> and I'm crying and the AD is just say pick this shit up pick this shit up and I, <laughs> man, no, why are you talking to me <laughs> like I almost got in trouble because I was sure this was it and it was never going to come back again and um uh, and then the year after we win this, and for me, going to the national tournament is just completely unbelievable. And I'm not even thinking about winning one game. I'm just like, wow, it's a national tournament. It's crazy. But uh, uh, so that's my, my way to go in the game. But I'm also not the, the athletic leader in the team, I would say, in terms of we, we have better players than, that, than, than I was. And, and some of those guys were a little crazy. Oh, uh, my, my yeah. friend Shelby Brown, completely crazy. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got it now. Uh, the, uh, our, our point guard, Brett Comer, completely crazy. And, and we had also a few really, really good players. 
And so, so I think when they started the game with the crazy confidence, uh, after a few quarters, uh, everybody was in. So all it takes in the team is a few guys to believe, yeah. and then it can lift up everybody uh, after that. But then second game, I mean, you win against Georgetown the first game, and they're number two seed, and they get this uh, this guy going top three in the draft pick or whatever. And then you play second game, and you play against the seven or eight seed. And so suddenly you have even more reasons to believe you can win the second right. game. <laughs> right. So by, by the end of the first game, then, of course, everybody was on board and really, really believed we can win. And so, I, I mean, I think it's really cool how, how um, the networks, they always do the, the one shining moments thing at the end of the tournament, and they, they really hype up the Cinderella seeds, and you guys were, it was like crazy hysteria behind you guys um, during that, that run. Um, who did you lose to? Who did you end up losing to? Uh, Florida. You lost to Florida. Wow, another Florida school. So after making that run, losing to Florida, how do you feel? Well, I mean, you know, we uh, we were we really went in against Florida thinking we were going to win actually mm -hmm. this time around, and and again we were up in the first half. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were uh, obviously we were sad to have lost, but uh, we also all, all tapped ourselves in the back in the back and, and understood that we made uh, we made at the time history and uh, it was really cool because because uh, we in just a matter of one or two weeks became like national sensation right so after that school was was really fun you know <laughs> <laughs> We could really do uh, almost whatever we wanted. <laughs> uh, so it was really a good time. It was, I, I, I keep really good memories from it. Can you remember, like, what does your coach say at halftime of the Florida game? You got, were, were you guys up or down at that point? I think, I think we we down like three or four. Yeah, it wasn't a lot. So what does your coach say to you at halftime playing against Florida – and and what what you remember what he said at halftime? No idea, man. I can I can. <laughs> it's, it's like almost ten years ago. Next, next year, <laughs> next year is ten years ago. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> All right, Sean. Good question. All right. Um. So after college, what's your next step? What was your next step after after that? Well, after the after the Sweet Sixteen run. Actually, that year at Florida Gulf Coast, uh, I lost some playing time, and uh, I can't say anything about it because we were winning. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also lost playing time because it was different, a different system with the coach. Uh, he likes more, he liked more athletic players, and and um, our best rebounders were our guards. So when I was on the floor, our best rebounder was on the bench. Mm -hmm. So. I worked too hard for this, and and I wanted to to transfer out, and uh, and I got to Hawaii, and in Hawaii I actually got injured, I redshirted, but I did a really good game against Baylor in the Maui Invitational, mm -hmm. uh, and one year after this, and every I mean I just wanted to go to 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 any school that I can do a master's degree in one year and then any mm -hmm. school, every school in the country offers me a scholarship, UCLA, UNLV, all that stuff. A complete, complete surprise to me. But I end up going to Alabama uh, thinking, you know, like they really sold me on the fact that they would really take care of my body, get me right. And all I'm thinking right. at this is to start my professional career not even looking to go to the biggest school nor uh, trying to get minutes at a big school. So I choose Alabama. I'm like, okay, maybe I play five, 10 minutes, but you know, they, they showed me on my visit, they can take care of me. I get there. Uh, I also got another injury before I get there and, and they see me, they basically offer me pain pills and I'm like, well, what is this? Like, and it was just really a shit show in Alabama. So after- Who was the coach back then? Uh, it was Anthony Grant. Okay. Dayton now, I think. Yeah. 
But uh, it really didn't go well for me in Alabama, and it was really, really dark moment over there. Mm. And uh, at the time, I just have no clue what to do because I'm injured and it's not getting better. And I got my master's degree that I can hold on to. But uh, with the team, it's not going well because I don't agree with, with a few of the things as well, mm. uh, especially with the rehabilitation. And so I ended up having a second blank year and finishing my master's degree and then going back and took a professional contract back home. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I played the end of the year in 2015, then I signed another contract, but I just had so much pain. My, my body kind of broke down at this point. Uh, and, and after one and a half year, not even one and a half years playing, I, I just had to stop. And I had the, quite a big surgery that really freaked me out uh, on my knee. And then another one because I had some other stuff they had to do in, in the knee like 10 months after, right. know, five months after, I'm sorry. And then I tried to get back to sport and my back started hurting and then my other knee started hurting. So I ended up, I ended up going four years back to back to back to back with uh, knee surgeries. And so I was handicapped basically for five years, uh, <laughs> which was quite a tough moment, but it was also quite a blessing uh, in so many aspects. Uh, especially the fact that I started to work with with young players mm. and uh, started the, the company that I'm living off right now and and started to develop ways to help young players that now turned out, turned into the book uh, that, mm. that I published a few months ago. Um, but yeah, that that's that's what ha that's what happened after college. So to to bounce back on your question from the beginning of was it worth it or not? Uh, <laughs> you know, I got my fair share of crazy dreams and uh, accomplished and crazy stories that, that just weren't accepted, uh, expected at all. Mm -hmm. But I got my fair share of, of really dark moment and, and my body paid the price for it. Right. Uh, because at the time I also, I took care of it meaning I was trying to eat good, I was trying to stretch, but there's a few things I just didn't know about, like pro proper sleep, that I, I never gave my body proper sleep, uh, proper rest. Uh, you know, I was obs obsessed with uh, practicing a lot, so this, this was my way, yeah, this was my way to gain confidence, is to, to make sure I did everything I could to be ready, mm -hmm. but I did too much. Uh, so at some point it broke down and um, it just said stop. So I, I really finished my career very, very fast. At 25, I was done. Mm -hmm. And uh, the funny part is that now I restarted at 30, at 30 years old. I restarted playing and I have almost no pain anywhere. And uh, having a lot of fun as well. Yeah. But I'm um, a professional. I, you know, I don't train as much as I used yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's talk about win the day. Yes. How did how did win the day come in your initial idea in your initial thought process that you would like to write a book, and what was the process behind it for you? Yeah, so 2019, I started. Uh, you know, I started to. I, I set up a, a way to help young players uh, to to gain consistency because. I realized even myself and so many of my friends growing up, we, we were so passionate, we worked so hard. Uh, and I saw so many other players in the last four years that I did, you know, the USA tours and I followed some of the best Swiss players uh, in, in their development, that there's really no guidance. They, they just left a lot to themselves, mm -hmm. uh, probably a lot like, some of those professional players that you try to help uh, getting overseas mm -hmm. and educate. And so the energy is here, the work is here, but it's just spent in every direction. And so I designed a way that I could uh, help players put all the energy in one direction. 
and 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 really maximize their potential as basketball players and 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 so elevate their chances to reach uh, the levels they want to reach and uh got a first client got a second client got a third client it was really really good results and at the same time i really really despise marketing and sales <laughs> no, and, <me> too. <laughs> <laughs> and so i at the time was reading a book that said hey if you become an author then you become this and this and that and the opportunity the opportunities uh come to you instead of you looking for them and so i was mm -hmm. like oh that's great and the next day i i started writing and i was like in three months i'm an order this is this is gonna be great and it turned out uh, a really really difficult uh project that took me almost three years yeah um but but from this initial thinking of of wanting to write a book to get clients it, it became a lot more a lot more i would say Mm -hmm. And so I'm really happy uh, because, you know, no matter what it brings after uh, in the future, I, I can truly say that I really put everything I could to right. give this guidance to the people who are going to read mm -hmm. it. And uh, those who are not going to read it, hey, good, good luck. Up, up to them. Good luck. <laughs> good luck. Figure it no, out. I hope, I hope you figure it out, but I, I think it can really help some of those young players. Definitely, definitely. Um, I, I read it while, while I was on vacation, and I, and I hardly put it down. So, um, so I, I think it's really good, and I think uh, the structure that you have and that you've created, I think it, it can really help a lot of players. Not even just basketball players, football players, soccer players, doesn't matter. Um, but I, I think it's, it's good stuff for, for for especially for younger guys to help streamline their efforts, like you said, and not just kind of be everywhere. So I, I really take my hat off to you for that. Um, and also what you said about about it being like a long process writing the book, I, I can attest to that as well. And and I was also kind of told, or I, I I think my my goal was why I wrote the book um, was to I wanted to be do public speaking actually, and it was kind of like I read somewhere like if you 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 can't be a public speaker if you don't have a book. To yeah. prove that you're, you know what you're talking about, kind of. I mean, actually, I wrote the book many, many years ago, but I didn't publish it, or I couldn't get it published because it's very much of a niche book. And yeah. um, then 2020 hits. I re, re, redo it with my best friend, and um, and we 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 bring it out myself. And but but I, my thought was okay. I put the book out. I, I become an expert, somewhat, and then. All these colleges are going to hire me to do public speaking. That's what my goal was. And it's crazy how in the course of, what is this, 2022? So in the course of two years, how my idea has totally shifted why I wrote the book or, 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 or what I would like to get out of the book. or what, and It's just yeah, exactly. totally, totally changed. So the that's process that's of writing cool. a book will really throw you for a loop. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the same here. Um. One of the principles that I really, really liked, and it speaks to me as well, um, was uh, you have different principles in, in your chapters for those of you that haven't read it. Um, and one of the principles was, was principle six, um, recognize the OGs. Mm -hmm. And um, I especially like that, how you broke it down, especially between micro and macro. I had never really thought about it in that way. So m macro are like Iverson, LeBron, Kobe, the people that show you how to how it's done or it, how it could be done, those are all like they have a greater reach. You know, those are the the superstars, right? That you look at and you're in awe. And then what you, what you broke down about the micro is the micro people are like the people that the everyday people, the people that helped you, the people that helped me, mentors, um, your parents maybe, or people that that help you along the way that you that you see a lot. And they're helping you for the reason to help you and not to get something from you from it, right? And I think that's that's a beautiful thing um, that that needs to be more put on a pedestal. Those those micro people, yeah. LeBron well, is, is showing you, but you're not meeting point, LeBron. Yeah, but my point is was even more than that. I I also saw so many players uh, were very talented, were probably even you know had all the chances they could 
to become really good players, but then they also rely on the wrong people because on the micro level, yeah. there's all those guys blowing yeah. smoke, there's all those guys promising yeah. this, there's the coaches that have no idea what's going on, and there's a few who really do, you know? And, and uh, I mean, we live in, in communication makes it that that marketing is important and, and people are deceiving to try to get their own ideas across. And I think it's very important that people recognize, you know, and sense who's, who's really knowing what, what, they are, what they are talking about because a lot are not, but those who are not, those who don't know what they're talking about, they also they often speak very loud, and they also <laughs> they also say what you want to hear. Yeah. So yeah. I've I've been around even just Geneva, just Switzerland, so many players and uh, or, 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 or people that were just saying some stupid stuff to players, and players just really believed it because that's exactly what they wanted to hear. And uh, and that's what I'm saying when I'm talking about recognize your OGs because the people you follow are the ones who are going to either get you lost or get you not where you want to end up or, or, the, or the opposite, you know? Right. So tell us a little bit about what you do besides the book and um, your, your, your stride, your passion, um, and your, your nonprofit um, where you help build uh courts and things like that in 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 africa tell us a little bit about what you do do with that yeah sure so after i finished uh, playing 2016 i started stride your passion and for four years i only did uh u.s tours so i would bring swiss players would go uh to play au and a few few of those guys who came with us are now actually two of those guys are now in the Swiss national team, so like the seniors, and we took about 20 kids who were part of the uh, youth national team, so we had really the very best uh, players for a while. And since COVID hit, mm -hmm. I actually, the year before COVID, I actually realized I could start, you know, quit my job and start focusing on only doing this, which was great, then COVID hit, so I had to reach <laughs> But now with Stride Your Passion, we only do local camps, uh, more grassroots for younger kids. Right. We do take care of uh, elite level players, the ones who want to come and work with us during the summer. Uh, but during the year, I just, just work during the school vacations mm -hmm. uh, in partnership with the local club here. And uh, we just really take care of grassroots basketball. And on the side of this, we, and since 2017, we have a non-profit association and we did a few projects, one in Guinea-Bissau, where mm -hmm. we renovated a court and uh, started an academy and uh, one in Tanzania, where we built this court from scratch that was completed last year. So still have to go there to, to visit the places because the timing didn't work right so far. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Yeah. So you're still around. You're still you're still passionate about what you do. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. And this uh, and and basketball is still is still providing. With, <laughs> it's uh, still beyond, giving you something beyond, beyond the the playing days, and and mm -hmm. I'm able to also share and have an impact on some some of those guys that are really passionate, like, just like I was. <laughs> so it's uh, it's really a blessing. I'm really big on giving back. You know, I mean, I, I play professionally. I was fortunate enough to play 13 seasons. I, I played in really great places and, and experienced quite a bit. And it would be a shame if, if us OGs don't give back more. And, and now I'm starting to see that a little bit more. Um, but back when I played, players weren't very interested in, in that community, that sense of community of giving back to players. And, and um, I think that drives me as well, just that, that, passion to give back and educate and and help you know and, and yeah. it's important man it's, it's, it's really important I, so, think, I think it is and that I, I mean i'm i'm pretty sure today it, it with internet and and all that stuff it also offers a lot more opportunities to 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 not doing it completely for free because it does take time and it does right. energy right. 
And so if you have to do it completely for free, it's also very hard to, to keep it steady, you know? Right. Yeah. So I got only got a couple more questions. You, you've been doing fine, man. Um, so now it's kind of like short answer questions, a couple of them. Um, what's more fun? Uh, oh, yeah, I have to go back. So you're, you're doing the three-on-three -three stuff now, 3v3, three three, um, and, and probably doing, doing that pretty well and, and successful. So now my question is, what's more fun, winning as a team with a five-on-five -five team or winning with a three-on-three -three team? Uh, I would say five on five because five on five you you just spend a lot more time together. Mm -hmm. So um, and, and you also have you have uh, uh, more people to have fun with mm -hmm. than than just three teammates with no coach. So so I, the, the more relationship, the, the more fun it is when you win. I think. Right, right. Um, what's your favorite college memory? Is it this? <sighs> Am I? Uh, this is this is the more the most meaningful one I, I think. Uh, go ahead and explain I, that because not everybody knows what I'm talking about. So go I, ahead and explain I, this. I, I got a few minutes. Okay. So, yeah, you yeah. got a couple I, minutes, man. It's, it's your I, show. It's your show. I was a diehard Iverson fan growing up. It cost me to lose the ball, turn the ball over way too many times, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, we play in the Sweet 16 in 2013 in, in the Sixers Arena. And and somehow, at some point, we make a run and I'm on the floor. And it's, it's, the, it's the round of 32, so we already beat Georgetown and now we're playing against San Diego State and, and they take a timeout and a whole, the whole gym is cheering for us. And... They take a timeout. We we are on defense or on the other side of the court, and I gotta go back to the whole to the bench. So I just, <laughs> I just started to go like loop side banana cut next to the fans with my with my hand like this. Uh, <laughs> Alan Iverson and and just just thinking Alan Iverson and I mean the, on this court, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was really individually that was really a special moment because I also made it completely naturally, like I was supposed to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know, my friend is an artist. Uh, if I can show you, I actually have this. Wow. This crazy, I don't know if you can see. It's all yeah. made of really small symbols, and it's uh, it's called Inside Out. So it's it's an wow. experience. An experience is felt outside in a way and inside in another way. It's really a meaningful piece of art that my friend made for me. Wow, it's that's dope. The only, the only piece of art I, I own, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and it captured this moment as well. That's <laughs> dope, man. That's really that's really dope. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. What would you rather have? Tickets for college final four or Euroleague final? Uh I would say Euroleague because it's closer to my home. I don't like traveling. <laughs> too much. Okay. What's your first pair of basketball shoes that you were really hyped to get? Like super like I can't believe I have these. What were those shoes? Everybody has that one pair of shoes. Well, I don't even know what they were. Some someone in my family came back from uh, from the states and brought back some N ones. All we wanted was N ones, uh -huh. N ones only. And it was it, they kind of looked like the ones from Vince Carter. Yeah, with the, with the different colors. But, yeah, but they were not those. Uh -huh. But I wore them. I wore them until they were just so small that they couldn't just <laughs> wear them anymore. But I really have no idea. I've never seen anyone with the same pair of shoes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, they were white and red. And, and I just really, really loved those shoes, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, we kind of talked about this last, this is the last question. We kind of talked about it already. But um, what has basketball given you that you can never repay? Growing up in Switzerland, and I see it with my kids. Uh, Switzerland, you know, it's a very rich country, and 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 kids are very spoiled. 
we are very spoiled. Now was one of them for sure. And basketball was really the only thing I did where it, it really didn't matter if you were richer, it didn't matter if you were poorer. It, it, nothing really mattered. It's only if you're good enough, you're going to play. And if you, if you push hard enough and you, you practice and you know what you're doing, you, you're going to get the respect and, and, uh, and, and you're going to grow. And if you're, Sorry, if you're being a pussy, then you're gonna be, you're gonna be on the bench, mm -hmm. and 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 really, this is so, so. To answer your question, I think it's really an education on 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 uh, getting what you deserve in the way, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. because because we tend kids in Switzerland and that, and me included tend to feel entitled to 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 getting a lot of things really easily you know and uh and and that actually is something that followed me everywhere i went because i was like okay i'm from switzerland now today i'm playing against alonzo morning's son and john stark's mm. son and and those guys are not better than me you know like mm. they they had everything they had everything but mm. but i gave i gave it all as well and I gave it all, and I'm competing part to part with those guys who really had everything given to them uh, as as basketball players. So, right. yeah, I don't know if I really made sense with my answer. No, you did. You did. Now it's you did. it's uh, it's really uh, something that showed me that you know, and and gave me the 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 value that mm -hmm. I just get what I can get whatever if if I really put my mind to it and nothing is given for free. Yeah. And and this is really a gift because because when things are just given for free, I don't think they mean as much, you know? Exactly. Yo, that, that was a dope answer. That was exactly that was that was a deep answer, man. I appreciate that a lot, man, because that was that was a really good answer. Um Yeah, man, you hit the shot at the buzzer, man. That's it, man. You you made ah. it through your first IG live, man. Wow, incredible. <laughs> so, man, thank you. I really appreciate you coming on. You were, you were a great guest, man. And and to see um, the view. Oh, wait, it's it's messing up. Can you hear me? Hmm. Come on, not at the end. Oh, no. I don't know if anybody else can still hear me. Can somebody write in the comments if you still hear me? I don't want to stop at the end. Oh, no. Oh, okay. He's gone. So, I guess everybody else is still here. So, I'm sorry that I didn't get to give him a proper send-off. But I thought Christoph did a great job. I thought he was he was so genuine and, and forthcoming with his answers. And um, I really appreciate him him coming on and, and explaining what he what he felt, what he's lived, and things like that. And also about the book. And I can only tell you teammates out there if you can get his book called win the day um especially you younger players out there um it'll definitely give you some structure not just for basketball but for other sports or your life in general and i i i hardly put it down when i was on vacation i was really glad to to have that to read and um i would really really suggest it for for pretty much anybody it's a great read and there's some really good practical things in there that'll help you on your journey and so um I was really impressed by it. And I'm really glad that he he was on. So that's it for, for tonight. Um, when do I have a next guest? The next guest comes on next Wednesday, I believe. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, yeah, so I hope everyone is doing well. And as usual, if there's something here that you saw that you think someone else might, might need to know or might be helpful for them, please pass this information along. Let's help our community grow. And I don't mean my community i don't mean followers or anything like that i mean the basketball community um, because that's what i'm all about is helping others so if we can help anybody with this show or any of the other things i do please share it and um, the community will grow and be smarter i hope that's my goal so um enough of me talking my stuff i'm just gonna take my new coffee cup with my logo on there thank you um and i'm gonna get on up out of here yeah hopefully those of you that were new will come back and those of you that were not new will 
keep returning. That's it for me for tonight. Hope everybody's doing well and healthy, families, stuff, all good. So thank you for joining. If you were here for one second or the whole hour, old head out. <laughs>